You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Before we start today's show, you like listening to our podcast? If you do, Take a moment and subscribe to the show on iTunes. It's absolutely free. And while you're there, leave us a review. And breaking news, the B&H Photo Podcast landing page is up and running. Our entire catalog of past shows are all a click away. You can find our landing page at bandhphoto.com slash explorer slash podcast. Also, something really cool, we have a speak pipe available for leaving audio comments, little voicemails right from the screen, some of which we might even play on the air. Think of it as going to the drive-up window at your local restaurant and talking to one of those, you know, clown things with a microphone. It's the same thing, except instead of food, you get feedback and you can hear yourself on the air. Leave invitations of Alan, too. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. That's right. If you can imitate my my laugh, there's a free Pepsi for you there. There you go. <laughs> free Dr. Pepper. <laughs> All right. Today, we will be talking about ophthalmic photography, photography of the eyes. We welcome to today's episode Mark Mayo, who blends his accomplishments in ophthalmic photography with a career as a fine art photographer. Mark developed the first high-resolution digital imaging system in ophthalmology and is a past president of the Ophthalmic Photographer Society. In 2006, Adobe selected Mark to be part of their Biomedical Image Advisory Group, and in 2009, he founded the Digital Imaging Institute to further the knowledge of imaging in medicine, science, and research. As a fine art photographer, his work incorporates his ophthalmic photography as well as landscape and documentary photography, including a wonderful series, Against the Grain, about the grain industry in Buffalo, New York. But first, Al's gearhead pick of the week. This week, Berger, the last French film and photographic paper manufacturer, has announced the rollout of Pancro 400, a new ISO 400 black and white film that will be available in 35mm 120 roll film. And get this, 4x5, 5x7, and 8x10 format sheet film. This is big news. The new film makes use of both silver bromide and silver iodide emulsions, which, as we all know, together serve up a wider degree of exposure latitude compared to other 400 speed uh, black and white emulsions. This is the first new film from Berger in 15 years and it should be in stock at B&H sometime in March of this year. And Berger isn't alone. Ferrania, which used to be one of the largest film companies in the world, an Italian film company, is reintroducing a limited run of Ferrania P30 Alpha, which is a reissue of an ISO 80 black and white panchromatic film originally released back in the 60s. It's available in 35 millimeter only. This is a test run for what they hope will be a transition to a beta release and maybe a full-time offering. Stay tuned. Film's not dead. Nope. Mark Meyer was one of those few people who've managed to successfully carve dual career paths, one technical and one aesthetic and cerebral. Mark, welcome. Thanks for joining us today. Your Thank turn. Thank you for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Great to have you here. So could you tell us a little bit about your background? Because you, you have an interesting background. Give us, give us a little bit of uh, a taste of where you were and how you got where you're going. Grew up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and found myself attracted to photography at the end of high school and and got accepted into a uh, photography program at a technical college, two-year technical college in Milwaukee. This is back in 1973. Uh, I had big interest in Life magazine because one of the ways I made money as a kid was actually collecting newspapers and magazines and selling them to the, to the junk man for money and would look (laughs) at life. I mean, that's what we did. Right. And took a lot of time, um, looking at those life magazines. We, we didn't have a subscription to it. And when I got into photography, I thought, gee, this is some great way for me to somehow use, uh, 
my skill and help people. I, I had this idea that, you know, this was the, this was the late sixties, early seventies. You were going to help save the world. And th- I was going to do you that. You and by, me both pal, you and me both. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we were going to do that by, you know, showing all the wrongs in the world and then magically everything was going to be uh, fixed. And in 1973, as I was starting life magazine folded. And again, this was, I was just turning 18 in 73. The Vietnam War was going on. Every night you'd see reports from Vietnam via satellite and video. And somehow I got it in my mind back then that the days of sending a photographer out to cover a story for uh, 30 days were over and that we were going to we were going to see our get our news and get these stories via via video and TV. And so as I was going through photography school, one of the advantages of, of going to a technical college and sort of having some things set up that you, we, we, all the photographers had the same English class and we had to do, and this was something really smart. They made us do a research paper on some form of photography we didn't know about. And I found this thing called medical photography. And as I'm getting out of school, I'm thinking, I didn't want to be a portrait photographer, uh, wedding photographer, commercial photographer, not that there was anything wrong with it. I just knew that that wasn't for me. And and I said, you know, here's this medical photography. This is some way I can use all these skills that I've learned to help people because we were, we weren't taught to be artists. We were, we were taught to be photographic problem solvers mm-hmm. so that we can insert ourselves into really anything that had something to do with photography and be able to, to make images. And so I Got this job, uh, I looked and found a job as a medical photographer, and medical photography is was used back then at teaching hospitals to help teach the, the other doctors, whether it be the residents or fellows who were learning to become doctors, or it was an established doctor that was doing some uh, research or some new surgical technique that they were going to be training their colleagues Can and lecturing I ask, them. What, what did that, at that point, what did that entail? You know, the medical photography, what were you, you know, or how were your, how was the shoot set up? How did you organize it? What did you come in with? What was there for you? What was the gear you were it, using? It, it varied from, obviously back then it was film mm-hmm. and it, it varied. It was, it was in some ways you were a jack of all trades because in addition to the medical things you were doing, you were doing PR stuff, you were doing portraits, you were doing, I had a, I had a class in school, uh, I had to do an aerial photograph. One of my first assignments as a medical photographer was to photograph the hospital because they had just built a new wing on it and they wanted an aerial photograph of it. So there was that stuff. That and you were, hi- you were hired by the, the hospital? You were an employee yes, of the hospital? Yes. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And, and back then, if you, and these were at teaching hospitals. So again, you had, when you say someone's a resident, I mean, I was working for the, for Marquette university, the medical college of Wisconsin, uh, and they had a hospital where they did all the training of their, of their doctors. And so there was myself, uh, the head of the department, a secretary, and actually we, we had two other photographers and that's all we did. So, but besides the sort of fluff in terms of we're there as photographers, we provide this other service. I mean, we were in there called to go into surgery to photograph both st- with still still images and uh, film. We were photographing through microscopes, uh, doing aut- photographing autopsies, uh, photographing literally because we worked with the pathology lab, you know, pieces of pieces of people in a sense, mm-hmm. uh, both small and, and big. So we, you know, the standard standard fare was a, a Nikon F2 camera with 105 millimeter micro Nikkor lens and a ring flash and being trained in surgical uh, uh being in a, in a surgical suite and what you could and couldn't do and where you had to stand and what you couldn't touch. But the you'd sit there and, and then the doctor would call you in to photograph different pr- parts of the procedure. So m- most of the equipment, it sounds like, was pretty much parallel to what you'd be using as a, uh, a regular photographer. It was standard gear. But it was, it was all, for the most part, macro uh, photography. And, and that, in a sense, was was it started to become the downfall of that profession because doctors started. I mean, doctors are very 
uh, interested in photography. And many of the doctors had better equipment than the photographers I knew uh, working commercially. And so they started getting their own equipment. That's one thing that hasn't changed. That's correct. That's, yes. exa- exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, and so I started to see, I mean, there were a lot of forces going on. Cameras became more automated. You had auto exposure. Then, you know, technology changes. And with those changes come other changes. And what started happening was the doctors just started buying their own equipment. And in a profession that at the time had maybe 15 or 1600 members back then in, in the U.S., now that organization is down to 40 people. And really? it's Really? Can I ask you at that time, did you, well, I have a couple of questions. First of all, how were you with the, um, with the actual blood and guts of it? And, uh, also was it kind of fulfilling some of the desires that you had had at that point to, uh, to be a, a, a photographer working for the, the greater good or, or did it not feel that way at the time? And, uh, actually in parallel to that, I was, I, I was thinking the same thing. You go to school and, and obviously at school, they teach you to be creative and they encourage you to use your imagination and stuff. And then you went, and I'd say wisely, uh, into, uh, an area of photography that was rather restricted and very, very technical, um, and unesthetic to a certain extent. Although I imagine you can have fun aesthetically Sounds with how like, you're yeah. using it. So did you have a, sh- just like to compliment John's question, did you have a problem transi- trans- transitioning from a creative photography to a technical photography atmosphere? Uh, no, because, uh, we we weren't. Tr- I had. I did not have one art course in my whole two years. <laughs> okay, it so, was, so you didn't have was, to go through the withdrawal. Okay, understood. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it was. We 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 were trained. Uh, it, it wasn't about expressing yourself through photography. We were trained to be, as I said, pro- photographic problem solvers. So no, that wasn't a, a problem. I. The funny thing is, you ask about um, being. The blood and guts. I mean, when I first told my mother that I got gotten this job, her first reaction was that I was going to be doing all the baby photographs, you know, the newborn baby, <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which we never did. They had some company that did that. And, and, and then she said, well, how do you, how do you know you're not going to get sick when you look at all this stuff? And I actually had never thought about it. And I think on my first day working, uh, we had gone to lunch and we were then had a beeper in case they needed something emergency, and we got beeped to go into the surgery right in the middle of lunch. Right, so I went from <laughs> eating to <laughs> looking looking inside somebody, and uh, and, it, and no, it did it didn't bother me at all. That wasn't, uh, but also then to to answer your other question is that I did feel like I was doing something. I felt like I. Was helping. I, I, I was helping the doctors learn. I was helping ultimately patients down the road because the more things happened and the more information was exchanged and the more people learned how to do things better, ultimately the patients were going to benefit from these new techniques. Something that that struck me when I was uh, doing my homework for this broadcast, um, you you're a fine art photo- you do fine art photography, but you also do technical work. And we're talking about the the human eye, and we're talking about cameras. And cameras uh, are very much like an eye. You've got a lens, you've got a uh, film or a sensor, which is like the retina. There's, it, it's easy right. to to draw the comparison, and, and it, it it dawned on me that. I ha- we have you, you okay? You, you're trained in ophthal- ophthal- I, I have trouble with this word. Everyone, uh, everyone does. <laughs> you know, th- 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 you, you take pictures of eyeballs, <laughs> okay? <laughs> uh, and then there's Howard Schatz, who is a an amazing photographer, commercial photographer, who for 28 years was the head of ophthalmology at the uh, University of Berkeley. And I then just yesterday I, I I discovered that Florian Caps, who's the founder of the Impossible Project, those are the guys that are making all the Polaroid cameras stuff. He's a trained biologist who studied spider vision. What's with you mm-hmm. guys? There's a there's a little connection going on here. Is this something we should be talking about? Well, I, I actually I knew I, I've known Howard ever way back. I mean he was. I mean, he was recognized in, in ophthalmology, the, the eyes broken up into different parts and people specialize in different parts. And Howard wa- was a specialist in the retina. But I got to know him not only because of that 
you know, being in op- ophthalmic photography and ophthalmology and reading his books and listening to his lectures. But then I also found out that he did his own fine artwork. And so he would have, like he does now in New York, uh, monthly meetings. But in, he'd have us, he had a studio in San Francisco where once a month he could, you know, photographers would get together and talk about um, their work. I think, you know, I, I went back to school later on, got a bachelor of science degree in biomedical photography, and then did two masters. But while I went back to school, I took a, a, a course called Creativity and the Arts and Sciences. And the interesting part of that course was that the actual creative process, whether we're an artist or we're in science, that process is, is almost exactly the same. Hmm. The expression of it, the expression of it is different. Mm-hmm. You know, what we do uh, with our image or what we do in Howard's case is in, in, in surgery or laser treatment in the eye and what he invented. But, but the getting there is so, so much the same. And you, I think you find that I, I find it now with doctors who come to my workshops. I mean, like you said, so many of them have cameras and they're involved in photography, but there's a big part of them that, that has, and that art background, there's a, there's a a very famous retina specialist in New York city. Um, his name is, uh, Rick Spade and Rick does amazing photography and he wanted to be a photographer rather than a, than a, Hmm. I mean, he's a internationally world famous (laughs) ophthalmologist, retina specialist who's invented all kinds of things, but he has an incredible eye and does incredible work. Can we talk a bit about the uh, your, how you got into the ophthalmic uh, work and then kind of be specific about uh, some of the gear that is used in that and how it, uh, how it would translate, again, for the, uh, the pedestrian photographer, as Alan calls us sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I was very naive about ophthalmology and why images were done in the eye. But my supervisor suggested that I look into this. Uh, and so I, I, I contacted this guy that used to work there and I took a day of vacation and I went over there and just spent a day with him to see what he did. And about six months later, he called and said there was a position open and I applied for it. But I had to, what I started thinking of was, you know, here I was as a medical photographer helping, but here was an opportunity as a photographer to help people with their vision. So what better way for a photographer to help people is than with their eyesight. What are some so, of the medical uh, conditions, if I may ask that, you're diagnosing with the techniques that you use? The first thing you have to realize is that the eye is the only part of the body that if you dilate the pupil, you can look in without having to cut or really you know, use some high-end specialized equipment in a sense. So you can see the, when you look in the eye, you see the retina, but you see the veins and the arteries in the back of the eye. And so anything systemic that's ha- happening to the body tends to show up in the eye too. So the most common thing is, is diabetic retinopathy. You have diabetes, you don't control it. It starts affecting your body, but you can see it in your eye and it starts affecting vision. Back when I started is when they really were starting to use experiment with using lasers to treat the back of the eye. So we would do um, a test where we had a specialized camera to photograph the retina and we do some color photographs on Kodachrome film. They'd be in 3D so that you could see any, um, anything that was elevated or depressed. But then we inject sodium fluorescein dye into the vein in their arm and it takes about 12 seconds to get up to the eye and it goes through the arteries and then back out through the veins and very quickly and we would do a series of photographs then that the ophthalmologist could look at to say make their diagnosis and then they would take the images into the laser room and project them while the patient was there and use the photographs as a as a road map on what they were going to treat the the treat the with the, with the laser Interesting. So, so what was the? You mentioned it was a specialized camera. What was that camera, or how how was it specialized? Uh, they they if you've ever been examined by an ophthalmologist, where they put a a light on their head, a very bright light, and they hold a lens in front of your eye, and they project this light through the lens. That's called an indirect ophthalmoscope. And so, what happened was they took that technology and built it into a camera, Mm -hmm. essentially, that sits on a table. So you're projecting this light into the eye, you're using the eye as part of your optical system, because you've got to go through the cornea and the lens, and that's actually your your 
optical system and then it's projected inside the camera and it's focused on there and then you were using a 35 millimeter film camera on the back so you're using nikons uh pentaxes contaxes whatever it was mm -hmm. it was just a way to move film right. and uh you know you do some photos in color with film and some in black and white and they were the cameras were called they're referred to as either retinal cameras or fundus cameras fundus referring to what the, the the back of the eye is referred to as the fundus okay and you said that you would take that series of photos at that moment uh was how long of a, a sequence was that and how many shots did you take normally the the dye took only about 12 seconds to get up to the eye so you would actually start taking photographs like one a second before it got up there and then take a series of maybe 20 to 25 images by that time the dye had already gone through the eye and was at would actually come back into it at a lesser concentration uh, and so you can, and you could only do this on one eye. At, uh, you can only get the dye coming in one eye at a time, you know, you couldn't do it simultaneously. So there'd always have to be one eye that the doctor told you was more important than the other. And then you'd quickly switch over to the other eye and get some photos there. Then what would happen would be so, it, it, with some conditions, the dye would either leak or collect into places. And so then you gave it back, back in the beginning, we waited 30 minutes and took some photos. But over a period of time, we found out that it was only we only needed to wait about five minutes. Took a few extra photos to show if it did that, and then the the, the test was done. And what was the advantage as a, of taking the photos? I mean, you you said that you uh, you blew them up and looked at them on a, or the doctors looked at them on a, a projected. But what was what's the advantage of doing that as opposed to just having the doctor look straight at it at the kind of live? Well. The, to be able to actually see the dye, you needed a specialized set of filters. Okay. So you'd have one set of one, one set of filters, very sharp cutting filter at 490 nanometers. It was a blue light that would go over. You know, the flash would go off and would go through this blue filter, be go into the eye. When it would go into the eye, and this dye would be mixed with blood when it got hit by that wavelength. It's almost like a black light poster, mm -hmm. if you remember those, mm -hmm, right? Of course, yeah. it, 490 is pretty low so, on the spec. Yeah, that is low. Right. But it was very sharp cutting. And so the, the dye would be, you know, when it mixed with blood, would, would get hit in the, in the vessels and then would fluoresce at 520 nanometers. So you had this very, very sharp cutting cut filter in front of the film that would only let 520 back to the film. So you'd only see the dye coming in and in the eye rather than visible light. If you were, if you were just looking at it as it went through, um, the other advantage was, again, we were doing this in stereo in 3d. So the doctor could look at it because it, where, where is it in the eye? There's, there's different layers of the retina. There's a layer behind the retina. Is it, you know, where is it? Because they needed to know that to help make their diagnosis and then have a treatment plan of how they were going to take care of it. Hmm. And, and in the flash you mentioned, it was the ring flash. Is that the, the, the no, 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 no. This was, this was a, a camera that had a built in flash tube into it. So it had, it had a, a, a viewing light that you'd use to focus and get everything set up and, and, and watch. But every time you took a photograph, there'd be a flash that would go off. And we're talking a flash intensity of maybe 420 watt seconds. And so there were big power supplies. I mean, they almost looked like studio uh, power supplies back then. And, uh, and that, and that was the, that was actually, you know, the shutter speed. You didn't have, you didn't have a way to, there was one aperture, so you couldn't control the aperture. The shutter speed was the flash. And the only thing you could really control was the intensity of the flash to give more or less exposure. What was the experience like for the patient? You didn't tell him it's only going to pinch a little bit at first, yeah, right? Yeah, no, no. The, do the, the, doctor, the doctor would say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if you think about it, you have, you know, someone's just gone in, they've been told that they have some problem with their eye that they've never heard about, <laughs> and that they're not going to have this test where we're going to inject some dye. Even though you, you've told them you're going to inject it in their arm, they hear you're going to inject their eye with it. Right. And so... <laughs> now they're nervous. And so, so much of this became um, patient management in a sense. How do you, you know, explaining to the patient, under, getting them to understand. 
that it wasn't an x-ray, that they weren't going to, they didn't have this passive role because if they moved, if they blinked, if they didn't look where they were supposed to, it wasn't going to be the best photos for them. So, and you're using their eye as part of the optical system. You obviously started uh, um, this end of the of the industry when it was still film and you saw it go through the transition to digital is it safe to assume that everything is pretty much digital right now and bef- uh, how rough was the transition because I, I remember we had front row seats to uh, uh, the pedestrian side of it watching people go from film to digital and there were some rough spots was it the same in the medical end of it well ironically we started using digital in 1984 so that is we were way ahead. yeah yeah we we were way ahead of the curve and I mean part of part of the, the the reason the digital came in was because when we would do these the for some for you I'm sure you've heard of age related macular degeneration yes actually I have yes mm-hmm. yeah and so part of that is that that there's sort of a break in a layer of your retina and a blood blood vessel from the the, the back layer of circulation in your eye starts growing up into there. It pushes on your center of vision and distorts vision, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. And so we do this dye test because those early pictures were very important for the doctor to see where that little vessel was, and then they treat it with, with laser. Well, I mean, it could grow overnight. So you would, you come in, you'd have the photos done, and then we'd have we do a stat processing. So someone had to go into the dark and develop that roll of film, and then let the doctor see it while the patient was still there. Well, uh, oh, gee, if we could get a digital camera with black and white film, because the the stuff of the in the dye was all done in, with black and white, because of the sensitivity and the whole thing with the filters and the wavelengths and being able to pick that up. So in the beginning, somebody came up with a five twelve by five twelve you know, K monochrome sensor for some camera that was used in industry that was then converted and put on one of these retinal cameras. And then that's how we started doing digital imaging in, in ophthalmology. And so it was, a man, we could shoot this pops up right on the screen. The doctor can look at it right away. And then all of a sudden you could take that image and transfer it over to a computer screen in the laser room and they could look at it and then do their treatment. So that's how it started with us. So it wasn't, you know, digital to us wasn't something out of the ordinary. I, I, on the other hand, was a very vocal opponent of it in the beginning because my feeling was that the image quality didn't, didn't match film. And so if I was, if, if you were going to be looking yeah, at, that's why I was thing, asking, cause I know early on, I mean, digital was miserable. It really was. It was. And, and so I would always be getting up there saying, yes, but you know, I always, in, in, in medicine, I use the, the yardstick of, but I have this test done on my mother. And if I can, <laughs> if I say no, yeah, right. Okay. Right. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and so if I was going to have it done on my mother or myself, I'd want film just because I knew the difference. And there's always people, there are always the, the people on the cutting edge, the early adopters, they want to be, you know, they were using it, but I just didn't feel it was good. And so that, that went on from 84 until in the nineties. And ironically, I was the one then that ended up <laughs> inventing the high resolution digital imaging yeah, can you, can system. You tell, for, uh, yeah, tell us about that. That's kind of what we want to get to. How, how did that come about? How was the process? What, you know, what, how, what, what hands did you have on it? Who did you collaborate with? Things like that. What, during all these years, I, I would teach, I had hired people. I mean, you, you couldn't go to school to learn how to become an ophthalmic photographer. So I would hire photographers and then teach them the ophthalmic photography part of it. When I was at Emory University, I had six people working for me just doing ophthalmic photography. Uh, I went up to the State University of New York and not only did I have a few people working, doing it, but I actually started a bachelor of science degree in ophthalmic photography. I also did adjunct teaching at Rochester Institute of Technology in their biomedical photography program, introducing ophthalmic photography to them. So I had a whole history of students. And one of my students went out, got out of ophthalmic photography and started selling uh, commercial digital uh, imaging systems. And he sold phase one. And 
when phase one came out with their first interchangeable back for the Hasselblad, it had a full frame 35 millimeter Phillips sensor on it with six me megapixels. Oh yeah. Yeah. The pro and So this was, yes. And so, you know, from 84 to that point, I was always looking at, well, there has to be some way to put a digital back on a retinal camera without, ha without, you know, excuse my language, bastardizing it because you have to, you know, take it apart and add different optics to it to make it focus the image on a small 512 by 512 K sensor, that monochrome sensor. So how can we just take a 35 millimeter camera back off the retinal camera and put something on that would be digital? And all of a sudden there it was, I had a Hasselblad, my own 500 CM, here's this back. And I had this idea that, gee, I could, convert this to put on a retinal camera. So I came up with a business plan and ironically I live in Atlanta and there was some big, one of the big photo, you know, imaging meetings in Atlanta, maybe it was the PP of a convention. And so I made a plan and I went to talk to all the top companies, phase one, um, leaf. Um, I can't remember all the, the other ones with this idea that I had and, all of the companies except one, all they wanted to do was sell me backs. Yeah. They, you know, and I'm, and I'm like, no, 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 I, I need your help to develop this, to work in this specific, because back then we weren't, you know, back then you didn't have USB connections. You, you were actually building capture boards specific to the, to the camera back. And one company called Megavision um, understood what I was talking about. And so uh, the Megavision was a scan back, wasn't it? At the time, right in, in the beginning, it was. Yeah, yeah, they right. they were they really started all this in in commercial photography, but they had one of the you know Philips sensors, and so Ken Boydston, the president, said called out to the office, said send out this stuff. I I happen to have a a retinal camera in my garage, <laughs> and 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 after the the meeting, Ken and I got together with the equipment, and within a day. Uh, had it working on the on the back of a retinal camera and formed a partnership to develop this for ophthalmology. I'm sorry to jump in here, and can you describe exactly retinal camera? The when I said before, the retinal camera was that indirect ophthalmoscope that it that's been converted. So it's a it's an optical system with a viewing system inside of it, with a flash system inside of it. It sits on a table. It's it's about the length of a, a typical person's arm long, and the patient patient sits. Uh, has a headrest. You've all been, you've probably been examined by an ophthalmologist or optometrist. You put your head up in a chin rest so your head's stabilized. Oh, yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, m m it's not it's not carry down. on. You can't get it on a plane. I know that it's too yeah, big. No, no. Okay. But your but your eye has to be dilated to be able okay. to do what we're talking about. Although there are now what are called uh, non midriatic retinal cameras, so you can. You know, your eye will naturally dilate in a dark room. Mm -hmm. And so now if you're just doing, say, a color photograph of both retinas, you can put somebody in a dark room, the eye dilates, you use infrared energy to align and focus, and then the, you take the picture and the flash is so fast that it exposes the sensor before the pupil can react and constrict. Where is this technology being developed is this uh american technology overseas this isn't the kind of stuff you read about in pop photo no um i, I think the 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 first company and, and and probably the company that like like a lot of things in cameras and optics uh was german it was carl zeiss so they they developed it in germany when i got involved in doing ophthalmic photography the only cameras out there were zeiss fundus cameras high quality, I mean, great optics, you know, built like a tank. They were never going to break. Um, what had started happening, though, was that's when the profession of retina specialist started. People, doctors, ophthalmologists started being trained as retina specialists when I got involved in ophthalmology in the late 70s. And so all of a sudden, these doctors were getting out into the world, going into private practice instead of it being at a university, and so the Japanese then, they were making these things in Japan, and so they started bringing them into the United States. You had you had Topcon brought them in, Nikon brought them in, Canon brought them in, Olympus 
had, you know, those were the four and Koa because Koa, depending on how old you are, I mean, used to make a, a two and a quarter square regular camera for, for regular photography. So those were sort of the five companies and, you know, the Japanese do, did what the Japanese do best. They, they are great with electronics. They're great with design, making things simpler. So all of a sudden this German camera, which had cables and cords and you had to, you know, you had to have three arms to use it. The, the Japanese cameras started being purchased in the private practices. Mm -hmm. And so they got a foothold into the, into the market by that and then pretty much took it over. All right. And then, so, uh, to get back to, uh, working, uh, with uh, Megavision to develop the sensor, how'd that go? So we, um, we, we made it work and then decided, well, okay, we made it work in my garage, but now we have to sort of, <laughs> we sort of have to do this and, and see if we can, you know, and I, and I actually started photographing Ked Boydston as my, he was, he was my, my test subject, my test chart in terms of, cause he had needed something that you could constantly, that wasn't constantly changing, mm -hmm. right? Because the person's eye played a part in this. So we, uh, we came up with, uh, we had one sensor that was color and one sensor that was monochrome. And our concept was building two backs to do th this. And then I took it up to, uh, state university of my old department at the state university of New York at Buffalo. And we went there and, uh, and tried it and it worked. And not only did it work, but then there's a, there's a huge ophthalmology meeting every year, uh, 30,000 people. And I decided to present it there. So I did a scientific, we call them scientific papers where you present what you've done. Mm -hmm. And then I rented a hotel suite, brought in a camera, uh, dilated some people and said, I'm going to have my harshest critics judge this, my friends and colleagues. Um, and so they came in and, and uh, I mean, my goal was to think that we could get as good as film in terms of image quality. We actually got better than film. Hmm. And all of a sudden the 10% of the people that were using digital, once we developed our system and started selling it, it was, it became the tipping point. And all of a sudden in 1999, 2000, 2001, that it changed. It was a sea change in ophthalmology. Um, you, you didn't have to you know, worry about, because there were people there like me who thought, if it isn't as good as film, I'm not going to use it on my patient. And then all of a sudden they were starting to see things on the digital image that they never even saw in film. And so that, that changed everything. And then it went, I mean, uh, I'm, I know these are broad steps, but then it went into production and it, you, was it Megavision that you work with or who, who did you work with to develop and construct this? Well, answer? yeah, no, I, I partnered with, with Megavision. We built them and then I partnered with an uh, ophthalmology company uh, to, because you need, when you're doing a medical device, you need the infrastructure of FDA clearance and, and all the things that go along with, you know, support, customer support, software support. And so I went and, and partnered with a company. And unfortunately, that partnership uh, I saw early on wasn't going to work. And ironically, I left the company just, I mean, I walked away from a lot of money, <laughs> good salary, a lot of money, a lot of stock. And I had my lawyer sort of craft a statement saying that I was leaving the company. And uh, I flew home from a trip with my wife on a Monday evening and I got up on Tuesday morning and I was going to put this out there and all of a sudden planes were crashing into the World Trade Center. Oh. And it's sort of, and it's sort of, uh, you know, sort of, you know, here I was without a job, without a company, without any income thinking that, what did you just do? Yeah. And then it put it into perspective of, 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 uh, you know, my troubles weren't anything. And a couple of weeks later, I put the announcement out and another company immediately contacted me, said, we want this technology. They had software already developed. And so I went there, took the technology over there with Megavision, and we virtually took over the, the market in, in the world. And ironically, because we're using the eye as a, as a part of the optical system. Yeah, can you explain that, that a little bit? Uh, I, you mentioned that a couple of times, and I'm, I'm trying to get my, my own head around it, my pedestrian head around it. <laughs> but can you explain how you're using the eye as part of the system? 
Because when, when that doctor puts that light on their head and they hold that lens up in front of your, your eye, mm -hmm. they're using your, your, your lens and your cornea as part of the optical system too. Okay. So what happens is the light goes into, the light goes into that lens they're holding, goes into your eye, and then comes back through the center of it using your lens and cornea, and then it's projected on that, on that lens, right? It's a projected image. It's not a real image. And so that's what the, that's how the retinal camera is built is to project this image into into the camera and it's sort of this virtual floating image that you focus on. And so the, if if there's some imperfection in your cornea or your lens that affects optical quality. When somebody gets a cataract, it's really the their their lens of their eye starting to get hard with age. And there's other reasons too. But if you've got somebody with a cataract, that's going to affect the image it, the quality of the image I can get through it or around it. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And um, um, go ahead. But but we, we what, what we did in our tests is we figured out that even though the, the sensor was six megapixels, the, the 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 resolving power of the of the of the lens and the cornea coming back out in this projected system was only four megapixels. We only needed a four megapixel full frame sensor. All the uh the operators of the cameras that were already working, uh, did they then need to replace their whole camera system or just buy the digital back? That, that was, that was my business plan was they just had to buy the digital back, okay. right? With a computer that was hooked up to it. You, you didn't have to do anything to your, your retinal camera other than now put this onto it. So it had to work. It had to work just like the camera did. And one of the biggest problems that we had to overcome was being able to photograph at a frame a second and display that image on a screen at a frame a second because that's how fast we needed to be and back right. then you know that was i mean that was uh, so the engineers the software engineers and the hardware i mean you had to fine tune, tune and tweak all of this to actually make it work right right can you tell us a little bit about the uh, adobe biomedical advisory group that you're a member of Yes. Um, so you Photoshop for up until 2006, there was just one version of Photoshop. And then Adobe decided that they were going to come out with what they called Photoshop Extended that had in, in part of it was the these tools for science, medicine and research, uh, the, these technical imaging tools. And so they created their biomedical imaging advisory group by sending out a call uh, and the, the call went out through at the time, uh, NAP, Scott Kelby's group. And I was a member and, you know, if you they, they asked if you're, if you're working in medicine or this, let us know I'll, Adobe's interested. And they, they talked to 500 people and chose 12 of us to, to work with them to, with this Photoshop extended. And, you know, you said my fine art photography and my t technical, I mean, it's finally, it was like, here is this program that finally, brought both of my halves of my photographic life together, you know, <laughs> right. and, and in one, in one place I didn't, you know, and, and so then that's what we did. I, uh, unfortunately, um, you know, Adobe, you know, Adobe sort of works in the premise, uh, if you build it, they will come. And in, in photography, in general photography, you know, they build a, a new version of Photoshop. We all get it because we're photographers and that's what we're using. And they seemed to think that that was going to happen in medicine. And it didn't because most people in medicine didn't use Photoshop. Um, there were problems. I mean, and Adobe even said that this wasn't something that was being built to diagnose and treat because then it would, it would require FDA clearance and approval, right? They mm, were just right. imaging tools. And, you know, then you had, you, you had, if you remember the cloning of Dolly, the sheep, right? That somebody did that. They are actually, actually able to clone that. And then there was some researcher, I think in South Korea who claimed to have cloned a human being. And, and when they started looking at his evidence, I mean, in Photoshop, there's, you can you can have turned on a very extensive history file that records everything you do, mm -hmm. and he, he he had it on. They looked at his history file, and he saw that he had actually then just you know manipulated the image to show that he did it. He didn't really do it. Oh, and that's I think terrific! That be, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but 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 that actually then opened up a huge 
Pandora's box because as 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 everything in medicine started to turn to digital, then you had people who were starting to do things with their images, even unintentionally, right, that would change the yeah. yeah that would change the data that they were getting out of them, which which that led me to create this group called the Digital Imaging Institute for Science and Medicine. And our goal, my goal was, let's, tr- let's teach people how to correctly use this. Create so standards that, and parameters, a framework. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that you didn't sort of, you know, I mean, there was a time where I saw some t- statistic that 10% of the, of the papers that were being uh, submitted for publication in the medical and scientific journals were being rejected because of uh, problems with image manipulation. Hmm. Now, is there, uh, this is a related question, in, in terms of ophthalm, ophthalmic photography, is there, what can be done in the post-processing that either helps or uh, in this case maybe hinders uh, what the diagnostics of it. Is there a lot that can be done? And uh, Is there room for visual expression and creative <laughs> expression in this? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just wondering well, more well, if, t- yeah, if you can, you know, t- if the manipulation in post-process helps you know, identify problems easier. There are some things like, you know, ch- you know working with contrast, mm-hmm. say, uh, or exposure. You, you, you have a, uh, an eye that has some, uh, some compromise in the in the lens and the cornea or the or the vitreous the gel in the eye right there's some blood in it and so you're not seeing things uh, as clearly and so you could you know bump up contrast a little bit uh, brightness you can uh, take something that might not be quite sharp and sharpen it just a little bit right you can do those types of things that help you but there's also things where you can use different in 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 the program, you can have different filters, in a sense, to give you different wavelengths and, and then show different layers of the, of the retina, right? You can break it up into RGB and then look at different things that might show you different, different aspects of the eye. Um, when we were selling, when I was involved in selling this, our researchers put together um, something we called auto montage. You know, building a panorama, but building a panorama of the eye. If the, the, these cameras only take either, you know, if you think of the inside of the eye as 360 degrees, really, it's like the inside of an egg, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the cameras would take between 20 and 60 degrees of that at one shot. Well, you have some disease processes that are much, that involve more of the eye. So we developed software to shoot different images in different areas, and then the software automatically take that and, and, and montage it, right? And it would do it so that it would adjust exposure at edges and, and things like that and, and account for the curve of the eye because you're trying to not make it a flat surface. So you had all of that that, that you could do with, the, uh, with your images. Um, that, but as, when, I, when I started doing the work with, the, uh, with Adobe and they started coming out with these different uh, parts of the program, I mean, one of them, I mean, I think we, people have heard the term tourist remover in Photoshop, right? You take five photographs of some, some plaza in, in, in Venice, right, on a tripod, and you make sure that all, in, in all the five photos, someone's moved in all of them, right? Mm-hmm. And the Photoshop takes it, puts it together, throws out everything that isn't in, in all the photographs, and now you've got this plaza with nobody in it. Well, one of the things with photographing the front of the eye is because it's curved and it's wet, you, you always get a specular reflection. So I just experimented with, okay, I'll take a picture with the specular highlight on one side of the eye, flip the light source to the other side of the eye, take another one, put it in there, use that technique, and voila, I had this photo of the front of the eye without any specular reflection. Right. Or, or even uh, HDR, high dynamic range. We would photograph, I mean, the, the pigment of someone's eye is relative to their skin pigment. So you could have some blonde from you know Norway that has a very, very light and bright fundus, and you have somebody from uh, so, uh, uh, African American that has a dark, well, the optic nerve in everybody is this yellowish bright area. So, you know, you photograph somebody and you might not get detail in the highlights and the shadows. So then I just played with and experimented with doing an HDR of the back of the eye 
to a- average exposure and give detail or you know image stacking depth of focus in photoshop uh the optic nerve is is a tube that goes down goes to the brain and so you've got one level up on the retina and you focus there you can't focus the, your depth of field is so limited the bottom of it is out of focus. So you could just, I, I would do like three or four shots all the way focused down to the bottom of the optic nerve and then put that together. And all of a sudden you had this ex, you know, extended depth of the field of something that you couldn't really capture in one image. So it it's sounds like parallel. Yeah. A lot, yeah. A lot of the, the basics that we know in terms of <laughs> F-stop, uh, shutter speed you're using all the time in this work and i've been trying to photograph john's optic nerve forever and i I, (laughs) you're right i just can't get the whole darn thing in focus really (laughs) i'm I'm just curious about one thing well you're doing a lot of very very uh targeted uh experimentation for the most part and you're looking for very specific things have have you along the way discovered something totally unexpected uh, uh, you're going after one thing and all of a sudden you go, hey, look at this, and you sort of discovered a whole other process or, or, or applications or something of that sort. Well, I, not that I discovered, but I, I can say that one of the things that to me was one of those moments was back in 1980 and 81, I moved to Atlanta, and, and, um, and then all of a sudden we started getting these young guys coming in with with this, with these findings in their retina that nobody had seen before. And, uh, I mean, that was the start of, uh, the AIDS epidemic. I mean, it was ah. before, you know, I mean, but because again, it's systemic and they were in more advanced stages, but nobody even knew what it was, but they were coming in because somebody had looked in their eye and said, look at this. I, I, I don't know what this is. And so we were very much on the forefront of that. Um, as a technology develops, different technologies get sort of brought in to the field and then things start to be used for other things. I mean, we, we, we have the ability to, to do what's called autofluorescence. There are things in the eye that if you hit them with a certain wavelength of light, I'm not talking about injecting that dye. I'm talking about just natural occurrences or disease processes that when you hit them with a certain wavelength of light, they fluoresce. And then you're able to, to record that. Um, I'm just getting done with a project now that we're using imaging in the eye to be able to predict Alzheimer's. Uh-huh. So it has nothing to do with vision. It's taking, it's taking technology that was developed for ophthalmology, for you know, studying uh, visual problems and using it, t- changing it, and then being able to now find people 10 to 15 years before they'd ever be, you know, diagnosed. Because right now the standard is you have this stuff called beta amyloid plaques. They collect in your brain. The only way you see them is with a PET scan when there's all of them. There's so many of them. And then the theory was, well, why can't we see this? If the eye is part of the brain, wouldn't we be able to see them in the eye and maybe see them earlier than that? So, yeah, there are things like that that are happening that I believe will continue to happen that we'll start looking at the eye in medicine for different things other than just for vision. It's an interface is really what it is to the human body between uh, the, the It's s- a portal. A portal, you know, I mean, better the, word, you know, yes, portal, yes. Yeah, yeah, you know, everybody says, oh, you know, the, the eye is a window to the soul, but it's, you know, in many ways, it's it's the window to your your health. And, you know, I mean, right. if you have hyper you have hypertension, you can see that in your eye. If you, you know, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things that I never even knew when I first started this that had anything to do with vision. And um, th- there you are. It's it's there. I have one more question before we take the break that we keep putting off here, but um, <laughs> this is a good conversation. Um, again, can you maybe just touch about touch on um, some of the things that we would, as regular photographers, uh, understand when it comes to you know, the focal length of the lenses that you're using and, and the, the general range of F-stops and, and the shutter speeds on, on the cameras. Uh, is there any correlation? No. It, well, it, interestingly, we, we're, what we're, we've been concentrating on is photographing the retina mm-hmm. and using a fundus camera. There, there are other 
imaging modalities that we use besides a, a fundus camera. One is called a slit lamp. So when you've gone into your doctor and they examine your, your eye, whether it's an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, you put your head up in this chin rest and they've got this instrument that they're using to look at your eye. That's called a slit lamp. And the, the correlation actually is that that slit lamp, we can, there, there are systems that you can put cameras on whether it was film cameras or not digital cameras. And the correlation is that it's actually like a mini studio. Mm -hmm. It's your, your, your product becomes the eye. It's what is wrong with the eye. And, and so a lot of it, I, when I, and I teach this myself, I, I, I equate it to glassware. You're photographing imperfections in glass or your, you know, the, the cut of a glass and crystal. And now you've got to use different lighting techniques to be able to, to show this. And so you've got this little studio with this, with these two light sources that you can change direction and shape and size and intensity. And you have a magnification system for uh, low magnification to a high magnification. And now you're lighting it to show, as a matter of fact, I'm leaving Thursday and I'm giving a, I'm a guest lecture at the New Orleans Academy of Ophthalmology to talk about this to doctors, how to to photograph the front of the eye, but that's all about f stops and and ISO and um, sensor size and color rendition and exposure. I mean, it's 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 all of that, except you're applying it to conditions, uh, disease processes of the eye that manifest themselves by showing up in different ways with different characteristics. And now you've got to understand that and be able to light it and show it just like you would if, you know, I have a friend that does glassware or someone that does uh, uh, metal, you know, mm -hmm. knives and forks and all that. Mm -hmm. It's all the same in a sense. And who's, who's making the lenses that you're using now? But again, the same companies. It's the it's the the company that makes the fundus cameras. Also makes slit lamps for the doctors to use to examine the eye, and then those have imaging systems attached to them to be able to photograph. Not it's not that common, and there are different ranges of of these things. I mean, there's there's one company that makes the high end photo photo slit lamp is sixty five thousand dollars, and it's just used to photograph the front of the eye there are other systems that might you know i i i i invented um about two years ago a system to put on that that uses an iphone the iphone is the camera and it's the computer and it's the monitor and it sits and it's integrated now into the slit lamp so the doctor can be looking at every patient and doing video or still photographs. And if they want to, they can take that and, and, and pair it to a, a monitor in the room or an iPad and then show the patient what their eye looks like. I mean, that's where we've come. And how much is the app for that? Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the app is actually free. The, the system <laughs> is probably uh, $6,000. Um, it's, I, but, I was actually you know, planning on asking you when all of this is going to be summed up into an iPhone app and you just answered that it's happening already. <laughs> well, well, and, 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 you know, we're talking, we're, we're talking about doing the retina. There's already people working on systems to integrate that. And I mean, they're, they're out there right now. I mean, you can, you know, the quality image quality still needs to be improved upon, but I mean, it all has to be on a, on an iPhone or a smartphone, um, whether it be now making it easy for everybody to have it, no matter where you are, but also in developing countries where you're able to take these. I mean, I, I've done work with a, a, a group based out of, you know, actually they're right around the corner from you down across from the New Yorker hotel in the building are called Orbis or B I S and it's the flying eye hospital. Mm -hmm. And they're mm -hmm. probably the largest, and I and I've gone on missions with them both to to I mean, they go into countries, they they we volunteer, doctors volunteer, and we go there and it's a skills transfer. The the country says this is what we we need to learn, and we go in there and teach them. And I teach 
I teach imaging of the eye. Uh, and but but if you're in Nigeria, which is where my first trip was, and you know, then now you have the ability to take a smartphone and go out instead of having people come to you and be able to do an exam and see something right away and and send it immediately and have somebody look at it and say this person needs this and then take care of it rather than lose the patient because how you're ever going to contact them again okay we're going to take a short break we come back we're going to talk about mark's fine art photography we hope you're enjoying this edition of the bnh photography podcast send us a tweet at bh photo video hashtag bh photo podcast Okay, we are back. Uh, Mark, you are, aside from being technically oriented and and obviously well-invested in what you're doing, you're also a fine art photographer and a very good one, if I may say so myself. Can you talk a little bit about that? How did you get into uh, uh, some of the fine art you're doing and describe what you're doing? When I started this, like I we started the talk here, I told you that I wanted to be a documentary photographer, and that that never died in me. I decided that... If no, you know, no one was going to pay me to do this, I just needed to do it myself. So my entire life, I've then worked on personal projects. And as I worked on myself becoming a better photographer, I mean, you, you get out of school and, you know, you're 20 years old and you have no clue as to really how you need to grow both professionally and in, in, if you're doing art in your, in your art, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words only if you got a thousand words to say. And mm-hmm. just because you make a, just because you make a, a, an image doesn't mean that it connects with somebody on a, on a, uh, at a different level. And so I always sort of vacillated, you know, I, when I had time, I, I'd work real hard in the medical side, which would then give me time, uh, periods where I could work on my personal work. And so I was always doing that. I, you know, in the beginning I said I wanted to be Ansel Adams. So a lot of my work, early work was a four by five view camera, but I I found out, uh, I was making these technically perfect, uh, uh, negatives and technically perfect prints that were, that were boring. They didn't say anything, you know, they were all about exposure and development and not about what I was trying to say. So, but I think a lot of us go through that, mm-hmm. whether now it's digital or whatever, we have to go through that process. Uh, I, I think didn't the have important thing that. is you actually acknowledged it. A lot of people never get to that point where they say, okay, it's technically perfect, but ho hum, two points. Good for you. Right. <laughs> well, and, and I mean, the same, and the same thing would happen in my ophthalmic work. So, I mean, if, if there were times when I couldn't go and do my personal work, I then started looking at my ophthalmic work and, and tried to be creative in it. I would do what the doctor needed to have done that was medically necessary, but I had the freedom to experiment. And so I would start looking at how I can make photographs that were more artistic, more abstract of the eye. And so I constantly did that. And it wasn't until, you know, we have this whole thing in our lives where we always say, someday I'm going to do that. Well, you know, to me it was someday I'm going to go to the Ansel Adams workshop. And then he died. Don't you hate when uh, they do that? Yeah. And, but so I went to the next one, which happened to be the last one that they did. Um, and it was really a turning point in my life. I, I spent an evening, I uh, was able, you could request to have, uh, Ted Orland and David Bales look at your work and they did a review of my portfolio and the things that they told me, the, the questions they asked really shaped how my photography changed. And it became about what I was really had to say rather than all this equipment and what you could technique. Do. Yeah. And so that set me on that, that whole, you know, at the, at the same time I moved up to, uh, the state university of New York, I, I went there with, with an, a two year associate degree in photography. And I was, uh, an assistant professor of ophthalmology in the medical school. Now tell me how I could have ever figured that out or planned for that. It's you, you don't, you, you take advantage of the things in your life that the doors that open and you work hard and sometimes it, it works for you. But then that gave me an ability to start doing my own work. And I was able to go back to school and I was getting my bachelor of science degree. And I started to work with a professor who had written some history books on Buffalo. And he says, you're a photographer. 
I want you to pick a neighborhood and use your camera as a way to learn about it. And that that's the 16 week course ended up lasting 16 years. <laughs> um, I started this project on the, on this Irish neighborhood in Buffalo. I discovered about the history of the Erie canal and the Irish guys that dug that hand dug it across the state and settled there. And then were the guys that loaded and unloaded the, the boats coming across the great lakes and went in the, in the canal boats. And I, I finished my, my bachelor's degree and said, there, there's more to this. And so I started a master's degree and I did one master's degree and then I did another, an MFA in photography and all the time working on this, but it, but it shaped my photography because there was more to the story than the images. And once I learned more about it, it's, it's this whole documentary process that I was going through that it was my, it was this project that I was using. I, I knew that at, at some point, these guys that were hand unloading these boats by hand still there were there were 80 guys left that were they were using technology from the 1840s i knew it was going away and i and it was almost like i had been chosen to tell their story before it died and i did and now i'm in the process of getting that published as a book but that's that that completely shaped the rest of my photography i i started then working on personal projects that meant something to me is this kind of what you always wanted to do at the beginning? Get back to these kind of uh, photo essays and and documentary style photography? Exactly, I was. And you know, I did a I did a project on family owned tobacco farms in in Kentucky because for me they're going to be gone someday. I just started a a project uh, a few months ago on cotton farming in Georgia. Um, Things that I see that mean something to me that uh, I think are important. But I've also done one on, on I call Saving Sight, which are nonprofit organizations that are going around the world and helping people with their vision. Yeah, it's sort of the combination of both my ophthalmology and my documentary, putting it together and hopefully coming up with some work that will move people to help, you know, donate money and help fund um, these people who are who are going there, you know, saving someone, saving someone's life. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you go to, you go to Africa and I mean, something as simple as a cataract surgery, I mean, people can't have it done. Right. And yeah, the one case I go to, and there's a, an older woman who had cataracts and because she couldn't see her young daughter, her young granddaughters pulled out of school to take care of her. And now I was going to spend, you know, until grandma dies and now she's not going to be educated. And, you know, so by doing cataract surgery, it, it not only allows the grandmother a better life, but it also gives her granddaughter a chance to do something with her life. That's a good point. And do you still work, uh, let's call it like the abstract images that come from the ophthalmic photography and, and develop them into their own pieces of art, photographic art, or is that something that now is, uh, fallen by the wayside if you're doing more documentary work? No, no. I mean, what, what's happened is uh, there uh, back, back when I started in ophthalmic photography, I submitted some photographs and they won awards in the chairman of my department. I had them on the wall and the chairman of the department was bringing some people through for a visit and somebody remarked about the photograph and he said, well, Mark, I'll sell you some copies. And so later on, I, I talked to him. I said, you know, I really can't. I don't own the copyright. So unless we, you know, redo my contract where I own the copyright, then I – and so he did. And he gave me the copyright to all my photographs. And so from that point on, every time I negotiated a contract with a new university, I had that – or even a company, I had to put in that I own the copyright to my photographs. Uh, just a, a last question I have. Uh, for your fine art work, what kind of camera equipment are you using? Are you shooting uh, – what, what format? What, what kind of gear are you using? Up until, up until the, the Ansel Adams workshop, I had – you know, I had, I had Nikons. I had a Leica M4P. I had a Hasselblad 500CM, I had a Linhoff 6x17, and I had a couple of 4x5 view cameras, right? And when I got done with that workshop, I, I, I sort of put everything away and started just using the Leica M4P at the time with a 35 millimeter lens. It didn't even have a, a light meter in it. And that's, you know, most of the work you see on against the grain and most of the work I do now, I mean, now I'm using a Leica M9P, 
with a 35 millimeter lens. So, I mean, most of my work is done with that. I do have a, a Canon, uh, uh, you know, 5D Mark II that I use uh, because I teach now workshops. Uh, I have a home on the Isle of Skye in Scotland, and I te- teach workshops there. So I'm using mostly the, the Canon equipment there. And I'm also teaching the workshop in, in that I do in uh, this area of Buffalo that I photograph to the grain scoopers. Uh, now it's abandoned uh, industrial space. That's, and, that's uh, the Silo City workshop? Silo City, yeah. yeah. So this a friend of mine bought six acres of these abandoned grain elevators. I mean, most people, even in Buffalo, had no idea that the grain elevator was invented in Buffalo. And so the highest concentration of these grain elevators in the world is in Buffalo. Most of them are abandoned, and this guy owns six acres of them. So I've got the exclusive contract to do photography workshops there. Uh, What about the I Teach You workshop? Can you elaborate on that a bit yeah so so a friend of mine and i i mean all these things we're talking about we 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 didn't even touch the surface on other types of imaging where you do ultrasound of the eye or you do something called an oct which you think of it as you know you have a cat scan where they do slices of your body Mm -hmm. well they've miniaturized that and do slices of your retina and so these are the things that uh i partnered with a, a good friend of mine uh, and we do a one day workshop that we call the essentials of retinal imaging in ophthalmology, because what's happened in my field is that the technology has made it so easy now to use in a sense that, un, you know, you don't have to be a photographer anymore. You don't have to be me anymore to do this. Mm-hmm. And so ophthalmic technicians who years past would get more training in how to do photography of the eye are just doing it as part of their everyday duty. But they've really never in some ways been taught. They sort of get here, we've got this, you got a job, now do it. And whoever was there sort of gives them a few pointers and that's it. So we've, we've created, uh, yeah, we've created a one day course that, that addresses all the things you really need to know to do this correctly uh, to give the doctor and more importantly, the patient, the types of images they, that need to be done to help them with their vision. And are you still actively taking, uh, ophthalmic images? Are you still have a practice in this? No, no, I, I don't do it in a, in a, I don't work in a clinic doing it. I, I have a consulting business Mm -hmm. where I consult with ophthalmic imaging companies right. on their products and developing things. So if I do it, it's all in the sense of, of testing equipment. Um, I'm also there in, you hear about clinical trials in medicine. And so in ophthalmology, there are things that are called clinical trial reading centers. So before the FDA is going to clear something, a drug or a technique, you have to show that it works and prove it. And so there are then reading centers around the world that, you know, you, you, you put together this trial protocol and in ophthalmology, it's all, everything you're doing is expressed in images. And then these images get read and graded and blah, blah, blah. And so I work with one of them to, uh, in, in, in that sense, in, in developing things for reading, reading images. But I also, on the other hand, will work with companies, drug companies, to when they have some problem that they have to address with a clinical trial by photographing the eye, I'm there to help them do that. Because a lot of things that happen to the eye through medicine have nothing to do with, you know, the medicine has nothing to do with vision. It's a, it's a, you know, a, me, a, a, a medicine developed for X, Y, Z, but as they're starting to test it, they find out it has some effect on the eye. Now they, now the FDA causes them, you know, makes them uh, show just what, what's happening and what extent uh, the problem is that they're causing. Okay. okay. Mark, thank you so much. If, if uh, our listeners would like to see more of your work and learn about your workshops, where should they go? Uh, go to markmayo.com. It's M-A-R-K-M-A-I-O, all one word, dot com. And there will be a – there's a tab on there for uh, workshops uh, that they can uh, get more information on them. When is the next Isle of Sky? workshop exile of sky is the is the um uh right at the end of may uh into the first week of june and then there'll also be one in um in in september it's a lot of fun it's a very it's 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 like six people it's a small group intimate group 
you know, beautiful place on the ocean and it's about people working together and we, all of us becoming better photographers, plus making some beautiful images. There you go. Are there spots open? There are. All right. Yes, there are. <laughs> After lunch, John's going to be booking it, I think. All right. <laughs> Mark, thank you so much for joining us. It was terrific talking with you. Um, that's a wrap on another fine show, in my opinion. If you have any thoughts, suggestions, or comments, please email us at podcast at bhphoto.com. You can also tweet us at bhphotovideo with the hashtag bhphotopodcast. On behalf of John Harris, Jason Tables, and myself, thank you so much for joining us today.